Hello, and welcome back to the Parasitology Lecture Series. The topic for this session is Taxonomic Classification of Medically Important Parasites. The point of this lecture is for you to be able to, number one, create or recreate the taxonomic tree for common parasites of medical concern. Number two, describe the common features of each taxonomic classification. And number three, classify common parasites according to their taxonomic strata. Understanding the taxonomic structure helps generalize common characteristics of parasites, which can aid in treatment, management, control, and even prevention of parasitic disease. This is the taxonomic tree that we will use for the rest of the lecture. Now, I made this by myself doing a lot of research, so I hope this simplified tree does the topic justice. Medically important parasites are primarily eukaryotic organisms or organisms with a membrane-bound nucleus. They are then divided into two big kingdoms. Kingdom Animalia houses the more cellularly complex worms and quote-unquote insects. In this kingdom, we have roundworms, flatworms, and arthropods. The phylum Platyhelminthes are further subdivided into two classes, your tapeworms and your flukes. Your phylum Arthropoda, on the other hand, houses the insects and arachnids, among others, that we are not including in this lecture. The other big parasite kingdom is Kingdom Protozoa, which houses the relatively simpler unicellular parasites. The more prominent phyla include Sarcomastigophora, Apicomplexa, and the ciliates. Within phylum Sarcomastigophora, we have the amoebas and the flagellates. The Apicomplexans, on the other hand, house the roundish protozoans as well as the blood-dwelling protozoans. Just a side note, some references use the term nemahelminths or nemahelminthes for nematoda, and coccidia is actually a subclass and not a class. Now let's proceed with the discussion with phylum nematoda, shall we? Phylum nematoda houses parasites more commonly referred to as roundworms. The prototype roundworm is the ever-famous Ascaris, while other roundworms include the other soil-transmitted helmets, some food-borne roundworms, and even some vector-borne filarial worms. Being roundworms, parasites belonging to this phylum look like your prototypical worm. Long, cylindrical, noodle or thread-like organisms. Size-wise, they may range from the microscopic to the length of a typical pencil. They have a complete digestive tract, meaning they have a mouth, intestines, and anus. they are distinct male and female worms, with males having testes, while females having ovaries and uterus. Roundworms also have sensory organs called amphids or phasmids, depending on where they are located within the worm. Most nematodes inhabit the gastrointestinal tract as adults, but some reside in the blood and other tissues, where they can steal nutrients from their host using their well-developed digestive tract. Phylum platyhelminthes are called your flatworms. Flatworms are divided into two classes. Classes toda houses your tapeworms, including your beef, pork, and fish tapeworms, while class trematoda houses the leaf-like flukes, which include the infamous blood fluke schistosoma. All flatworms have typically flattened bodies covered with tegument, a metabolically active body covering which also acts as both sensory apparatus as well as nutrition-absorbing organ of the worm. Flatworms are generally hermaphroditic except for schistosoma. Tapeworms are typically longer than flukes, and their body is segmented into smaller subunits called proglotids. They also have a prominent anterior portion called the scolex. Flukes do not have a scolex or proglotid. Cestodes or tapeworms are further subdivided into two distinct orders. Pseudophilidians have flat, elongated, spatula-like scolex, and their ova are not operculated. They also have non-branching uterus inside the proglotids. Among medically important parasites, only diphilobotrium belongs to this order. Cyclophilidians have globular scolices with four prominent suckers. Their ova are not operculated, and their proglotids contain visible, highly branched uteri. Most medically important tapeworms are cyclophilidians. 
There are numerous genera of arthropods that can be considered as human parasites, with the ones here only representing the more commonly referred ones. Other parasitic arthropods include your cockroaches, caterpillars, hornets, and wasps, and a bunch of other nasty bugs. Most parasitic arthropods are ectoparasites, while some are also vectors to other parasites. Parasitic arthropods generally have bilateral symmetry, segmented body, and jointed appendages, and a chitinous exoskeleton. The more common parasitic arthropods belong to two classes, the insects and the arachnids. I will actually leave this up to you to research what the difference between insects and arachnids are. The next section will lump three classifications together, Subphyla sarcodina, or the amoebas, and Mastigophora, or the flagellates, both of which are collectively grouped into the aptly named phylum sarcomastigophora, plus phylum ciliophora, or the ciliates. All of these protozoans are amoeboid in nature, especially in their trophozoid stage. But this slide actually classifies the parasitic protozoans according to what they use to move. Sarcodinians use hyaline, foot-like extrusions of the ectoplasm called pseudopodia or false feet. Mastigophorans use one or more flagella to propel themselves, while ciliophorans use very small and fine, hairy cilia for general movement. Just a quick note, those with asterisks are organisms who are not considered to be naturally parasitic, but are still studied in medical parasitology as indicator organisms. Apicomplexans are obligate intracellular parasites. They possess the apical complex, which are a collection of organelles and secretory structures needed to help the parasite infect the host cell. Coccidians are protozoans that generally maintain a circular shape, especially during their cystic or oocyst stage. Coccidians also have a conoid, or a feeding tube, which it uses like a straw to feed on the components of other cells. Coccidians generally reside in the gastrointestinal tract of their definitive host, but toxoplasma life cycle is more complex than that and will be discussed in a separate video. Hemosporidians, or protozoans that live inside blood cells, do not form oocysts. They also do not have a feeding tube, hence they need to invade the cell in order to gather nutrients. Plasmodium is the best prototype member of this group, and we can also lump in this group Babesia, which technically belongs to another order, order Pyroplasmida. Let's again take a look at our parasite taxonomy tree. I hope by this time, you can visualize the general characteristics of each classification, as well as enumerate probably a few examples of medically important parasites within each of the classifications. To summarize this lecture, here are a few key points. Medical parasites are single or multicellular eukaryotes composed of animals and protozoans. Nematodes are roundworms with a complete digestive system. Platyhelminthes, or flatworms, are either segmented cestodes or tapeworms, or unsegmented trematodes or flukes. Cestodes are other pseudophilidians, or those with spatula-like scolex and unbranched uterus, or cyclophilidians, or those with round scolex and highly branching uterus. Parasitic arthropods can be insects, arachnids, or a bunch of your other bugs. Parasitic protozoans can be classified according to their mode of locomotion. Pseudopodium for sarcodinians, flagella for mastigophorans, and cilia for ciliophorans. Parasitic protozoans can also be classified according to their specialized infection machinery called the apical complex. Most parasites in humans inhabit the gastrointestinal tract, but some inhabit the blood and blood cells while some parasitize even outside of the human host. Parasites can get nutrients from the host either by simple absorption of nutrients using their digestive systems or by complex metabolism of intracellular molecules using different organelles. And lastly, knowing these general features of parasites based on their taxonomic classification can help medical personnel understand why and how certain parasites behave the way that they do so that they can develop appropriate strategies 
that are most effective against them. And that's the whole point. If you learned something, feel free to share this video. And don't stop learning.